I have a new friend that I've just recently met and we met on the Clapper app. I just now kind of started posting some of my content over there. Charles is fresh out of the penitentiary. Ooh. He is currently in a halfway house. Please meet Charles Harden. Hi, Charles. The way the Clapper app works is it has like a little, like a community group chat. And I just threw one up there uh -huh. that said prison to purpose. And Charles, you hopped on that chat because you have big plans. So I want to get into yeah. everything. <laughs> I want to get into all that. So Charles, let's just start with how much time did you do? Who? Well, 30 years in total, but not 30 years consecutive, right? So I've done 10 years and then Ohio have guidelines. So my guidelines allow me to go back to the community after 10 years. And then I committed a federal crime and I've been locked up the last 22 years straight. So I'm like 32 years in on confinement. Our choices wow. have consequences. What I did was I tried to make the best out of my situation by through education, right? I did everything that I believe that somebody in my situation should. I got my GED, right? I went to college, but then they cut out the Pell Grant, so I couldn't get an actual degree. But still, you know, the information and the, and the relationships that I build, I'm benefiting from all those. But I just don't have an actual degree, and I'm, I'm good with that right now. I joined the Clapper app because that's where we met. You know, I joined the Clapper app because I actually been home. I actually left the actual prison a year ago. This is my third halfway house. And it's like from the time that I left prison to now, it's like I have these little bitty issues transitioning. You know, <clears throat> nothing criminal, nothing. I never do another crime, right? But it's just that society to me has changed so much. It's like the mannerism, the way people talk, you know, the way people just get close to you, you know, it's a challenge for me right now just to be that interactive with everybody in the community that I'm unfamiliar with. This where I'm at in this facility, that's one of the things that I do. I interact with people from all different type of cultures, different personalities. Some people are positive. Some people are super negative. You know, I'm dealing with that. You know, so the tools that I had in prison, so I want to take the ones that worked it for me and I want them to apply them to myself and my community. So that's why I'm not rushing to go home, but I am excited to be able to go home. When you got out of so, prison, did that, did you went, you went straight to a halfway house? Is that how it worked? Yes. Yes. I walked out the prison door into my sister car. She drove me to the halfway house. Here I am. A wonderful ride. Wonderful ride. You hear me? It's, it's, it's shout out to my sister Shelby too, right? Because she has been like more than a support system. When my, my mother was murdered while I was in, incarcerated, that was like everything. But then my sister, when she stepped up, it was like heaven sent, you know? Because she stepped up in all the right areas. Like, we're not talking about someone who just sent me money to buy like Debbie's and chips and cookies to try to be comfortable. You know, this is somebody who was sending me books and introducing me to new type of, uh, uh, of women who shape history. So, you know, I, I was thankful to have her in my life because her influence and, and what was on her mind made an impression on me. And, you know, as a result from that type of support, you know, I'm standing for, I'm educated, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm driven and I'm thankful to have that type of support. Trust me. On that same note, Charles, if someone out here is watching and they have a loved one who's incarcerated, what would your advice be for them? How do they support them? Okay. Listen, very good question. I'm glad you asked that question. I would tell you this. Make them stand on what they say. Like, make them articulate it. Make them demonstrate that they understand it. Because I've been around a lot of guys, right? And a lot of guys may say something like, oh, hey, you know, um, when I go home, I'm into the stock market. Let's use that for an example. And, you know, they would tell their families and they'd tell their friends, you know, hey, I'm, I'm in the stock market. I'm, I'm, in, I'm learning how to invest. When I come home, I'm going to just be so much better, right? But 
what the family don't see is that the person that's talking doesn't have no books, right? Doesn't follow it on TV. It's like a surface level conversation that they're having with people who don't have no idea what they're talking about. Now, I see that I've seen that so many times every day through in throughout. So my advice for the people who are watching this and you have a loved one in prison and they're, and they're explaining to you, telling you all the good things that they want to do, then you support that by sending them information that's relevant to that, right? By, you know, asking them questions, maybe to increase your understanding. Just, just make sure that whatever they're telling you, that you can actually support. Example, Marcy, if I tell you, like I tell my family, right? You know, I'm coming home and this is my goal, right? My goal is to publish my book. My goal is to network with people who can move me towards what I want to do, which is, is, is re-entry work. I, I want to I return back to the prison, but not as an inmate. So now here is me and you talking. We're only talking because this is the path that I'm traveling. If I wasn't traveling this path, me and you wouldn't have this conversation. But me and my family have had this conversation for years. Now I'm, I'm, I'm partly home. Now I'm having this conversation with members of my community. Everything that they did for me, the books, the conversations, they're now going to zoom in and see all their and, and see that I'm going to prove them right for all their support. That's where I'm at with it. So Their support and in your interest and your endeavors, that was like their investment in you. Can we kind of backtrack to tell me how old were you when you started getting involved with the legal system? Wow. Well, uh, let's say about 13, right? Uh, I grew up, let's do this. Okay. So I, I grew up regular middle class. You know, my father worked at Jenna Motors in a car plant. And then my mother did like odd jobs, home health care, uh, uh, janitorial work, cleanup, you know, so we grew up kind of, you know, we had the weekly allowance. We couldn't stay out all night. You know, our mother was on our top. But then, unfortunately, my mother developed a crack habit. The, the way that she nurtured us changed, but it changed for the worse. I mean, you know, no more weekly allowance. We don't even know what that is. Somebody telling me and my brothers and sisters to come in at a certain time. We don't know what that is. You know, we, so, you know, I grew up, my environment started changing like that. And then my father passed away and then my mother developed that drug addiction. Right. So for me, without that guidance and out that nurturing, you know, I was able to just roam. I didn't have that guidance once I was a teenager, you know, I did things, you know, as a youngster, I stole bikes, I, I fought, you know, and all these things landed me like in some type of juvenile facility. And then I'll be released. Then I go back for something, you know, not going to school, things like that. As an adult, as a grown man, when I look back, okay, I understand a couple things, right? That some of the decisions that I made, for an example, I did a robbery and I was bound over, right? So, you know, I robbed somebody. I should be consequenced, right? However, you know, it's some circumstances that, you know, I agree with that I've learned to accept is that most of my thinking was a product of my environment, right? I'm not making an excuse. What I am is just, I'm reflecting, right? When I had both of my parents in my life, I played the violin. Shout out to Chartwood High School. I played the violin at the high school. I was, I, I took karate, you know, I, I was a, a nice young man. But then in the absence of there, of my having my both of my parents, you can see the change and my change unfortunately was more social, more criminal, just more do what I want. And there you have it. The, the legal system didn't tolerate me a lot. They sent me to adult prison. I turned 49 a couple of weeks ago. I went in, I was 17. Last week I turned 49. We could fill in the blanks. When you look back at your childhood, two working parents that were mm -hmm. active in your life and then you lose your dad and your mom picks up a, a substance and gets involved with that. And she's doing that probably to numb her, her feelings and the emotions over losing her spouse. And in the mix, I'm just wondering 
now as this 49 year old man, when you look back at those times, was there, is there something that you think the community could have done to help support you and your family during that time? Let me say this, let me say this, absolutely, right? But now let me tell you what happened factually, right? During my juvenile court case in another state up on Capitol Hill, I can't make this up. A guy came out with a study, you hear me? And he said that juveniles like myself, that if we was to be sentenced in a juvenile system, that the, the resources and the amount of time that we would spend in there till we are like 21 years old, she testified that that, that would not be enough to rehabilitate me, a, a kid that robbed, uh, 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 what was it, a check exchange? It was like 30 years ago. I robbed some type of establishment, a few hundred dollars, right? She came and she testified that my actions demonstrates that I could not be rehabilitated in a juvenile system. So the judge took that report and he used that as the basis to send me into the adult system, right? So now here we are. I'm in the adult system. Last year, somebody told me that, hey, go check the computer. I think they're trying to let all the juveniles go home. That's how I heard about it. I'm on my regular day. And somebody who knew that I've been in there since I was a child told me to look on the computer. So I go and I look on the computer. Sure enough, the Supreme Court had issued a ruling. And that same report that got me put in prison as a kid, the basis of that ruling was that the report was flawed. Not only flawed, the guy who made the report came out and admitted, like, hey, listen, I was wrong about a lot of things. So now today, because of that, I, I, I'm a free man. Well, I'm in the halfway house, but I'm no longer in prison. Let's say 11 years, right? Without that ruling, without that guy stepping up and saying, listen, I was wrong, I would probably be in prison maybe 11 more years right now. So, I'm, 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 you know, it's like, okay, I'm grateful that he had enough courage to admit that he was wrong. I'm grateful for everybody who was fighting on our behalves. But what strikes me odd, I'm not gonna say what strikes me odd, I'm, matter of fact, I'm gonna say this, what makes me even more appreciative is that I, I'm talking local, I'm talking Ohio, right? In Ohio, 140, 168 of us was affected by the ruling, right? Out of 168 of us that went in front of the Ohio Parole Board, how many of us do you think was returned back to the community? I don't know, half, 80? 80? Wow. I mean, that would be a, some relief, you know, If but 23 of us came home. 23. So me being home is is special and unique with just within itself. Out of 168 people that they sat down, talked to, because you got to remember here in Ohio, the parole board is serious about protecting the community. You hear me? I'm talking about if you have any discrepancies, you know, if, if your paperwork, if I put Charles L. Harden, because my middle name is Lamont, on my paperwork, but they can't verify the L, Oh, I'm going back. They're going to send me back to jail. I'm going back until they verify why L in the middle of my name. Ohio is that serious. They don't play no games. You will be in jail for to somebody feel like you shouldn't. So now it's what are you going to do with that opportunity, right? So you have this little treasure and now it's what are we going to do with it? I want to talk about the parole right. board real quick in Texas. You don't go in front of a board. It's just your file passed around some desks. So you don't ever see the parole right. board. Can you tell us how it's done in Ohio? Okay, so here in Ohio, you go in front of six members, right? Because you have to have, a it's, it's 12 members and then there's a chairman. In order to gain your release, you have to have a majority vote. When you go in front of the members, you go in front of six members. That's how it's set up. Sometimes you may have five members. You know, there's certain situations where you may not have all your members there. But just overall, you go in front of six parole board members. 
you know, you have your moment in order to, you know, to talk to them verbally, to uh, answer any questions, to, to express what you want to express to them. And then there's a period from that initial part where you step out for a while and then they talk amongst themselves. And then once they talk amongst themselves, you step back into the hearing and then that's when they give you their overall opinion or their decision. Right then and there. They don't take it back to their office or it's it's a done deal right there. Okay, so what they do is they vote, right? Like, let's, let's use my case for an example. I, ha I went in front of six people. In my case, I received a six to zero vote to obtain my freedom. So they send you the vote and then they also send you the reason, right? So now let's say that I didn't get a six to zero vote. Let's say I got a five to one vote. What they would do in situations like that, I'm talking about Ohio, they will send you to what they call like a Colbert hearing. That's a separate hearing where they have all 12 members there. You see what I'm saying? So then all 12 members decide if you should stay in prison or if you should not, if the six members have any issues making that decision. So, you know, they have a system and a process that they go to. And in Ohio, it's, it's, it's lengthy. How did it feel knowing that you were going home, that you made parole? It was like another place in time. When I, when I was hearing about it, because I didn't follow the case, you know, in 30 years of incarceration, I have been through so many rulings that could, oh my God, when you're going to go home, here's another ruling. That after about 10 years, you get burnt out on that. So I don't even I don't follow every case no more. I hear about it, but I don't invest my time in it. This time, it was like it was. I, I, there's no words. I sat down in front of the computer, right? So I said, "Well, let me look and see." And then when I seen it, it had the Senate bill house number. It was like you are uh, your your situation is is relevant. You know all the languages to let me know like, hey, I've been looked at. And this is when you go to the parole board. That's when the numbness kicked in. That's when it's like, I'm sitting there like, the process of going from the next 11 years to I might be getting out in August and this is June, that's that's something like that. The process is, I can't, I, I, I can't articulate it. I, there's no words to, to describe that, that that feeling or how you process that. How did your sister react to knowing you were coming home? And first thing she wanted me to do was give them her address so I can come there tonight, like right now. When I was telling her about it, she was like, oh, hold on, write the, you got a pen, let, write the address down. Like, I'm not coming home tonight. Like, But the yeah. excitement was like, you had to try to contain it. It, it, it was an exciting moment. It was, you know, it was special. You said that you were able to get on a computer. You had computers available to you in prison? Okay. So that would be like a no and a yes. Like you don't have internet connection in prison, right? But they do have like computer classes where they will teach you the basics, right? But for what I'm talking about, I wrote my book in prison. I know we haven't talked about the book, me and you have personally, but I wrote my book during my federal incarceration. And then when I returned back to Ohio, I typed it up into a manuscript, like the old typewriters where you do the tip, 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 tip. That's our internet in prison, right? So I, you know, I, I, I typed it up. And then when the, uh, the stimulus came out, and, and mm -hmm. they actually was giving them the prisoners? What? I took the first $1,200 stimulus check and I sent it to a company called Arthur House. And I said, listen, this is my writings. I want the $1,200 package. Let's get to it. Like the computer stuff, the data, all them things was done by Arthur House and my sister. I just managed the process, you know? But my book, I was able to publish my book primary with the help of my sister, my brother, Jai Richards, who was actually in the same prison with me. He bought the typewriter, right? Because I wasn't going to type the book. I wasn't. But he read it and he believed in it so much 
that he went, typewriters is $211. I write just fine for $211. He went, my brother, he went and bought a typewriter. Then when he bought the typewriter, we discovered that ribbons was like $6.99. And I'm going to get like eight pages of ribbon. This page, this book is going to be like 300 pages. You do the math. So my baby sister kicked in first. She bought me like six ribbons, right? And then other inmates in the facility, you know, as I typed it my book up and as people read it, because, you know, I was like seeking out people's opinions. And then like people would be like, like what's up with the book? i will be like, man, I can't write. I can't type it right now. I ran out of ribbons. Inmates start giving me ribbons. Here, bro, I got a ribbon for you. I had it for a long time. So if I didn't believe in it myself, so many people around me believed in it and pushed it that it was like I had no choice but to publish. I had no, like, my environment and the people close to me, they would not let me not succeed in that goal. So I published my book from prison, and I didn't do it alone. Yes. I love that you had so many people believing in you and that you set out that goal and you followed through with complete to completion. So you said a couple of things that I want to touch on. The first thing is I was also incarcerated when those stimulus checks hit. I yes. also remember that like the prison staff and then there was even some outcry from people in the free world about why, why are incarcerated people getting this? You know, the fact is they spend money. Right. So it does stimulus the economy. That, right. That's what I just wanted to definitely highlight the fact that you used that money for a serious investment in your future yes. and to help others. Immediately. It wasn't even a thought. Soon as they, as soon as they called us in there and we filled out the little forms, and the money actually hit my account, I was already knew my plan. When I got the stimulus money, I already knew where it was going and everything. And Arthur House wanted like $12.99. So my sister chipped in with the other 99. You know, I just gave him the whole the whole 1200 right? Because, you know, the stimulus checks came in increments. But we didn't know that at the time. But as soon as I got that 1200 and then my sister put 99 with it, Everything else is history. You know, everything else is, is now you Google my book and you read it. And if you want to join in the conversation, then, you know, you can log on to my website and we can have those conversations. Yes. G give it to us, Charles. Tell We want to know what, and I'll make sure and put the information in the um, bio of this video so that people can find you. But tell us now. Uh, how can they find you? What's your website? What's the name of the book? Give us all the good details. Okay, then I do this. Okay, so the book is, is, is I titled it Jailhouse Islam, right? So let me let me address the, the elephant in the room. Okay, so first of all, I'm not a Muslim. I used to be, I used to practice Islam, but then I learned about the religion. And once I learned the religion, for me, I was able to say, okay, I'm not a Muslim. But I, I'm only saying that I'm not a Muslim because I, I learned the religion and I learned what I needed to know. So, you know, I don't want nobody to feel, because, you know, people have innuendos. You know, people want to think something happened. Why well, you're not a Muslim no more? Did y'all fall out? Did, what's up? They're like, they be looking for, like, negative kind of, you know, nah, bro, everything good. You know, it's just that my studies led me to realize, like, this is not the path that I'm on. However, I was been a Muslim since 93. So here we are like in 2014. But the difference is, is that when I was in the state system, my interactions with Muslims from the globe was limited. But then during my federal incarceration, now I'm with, I'm actually with Muslims from all over the world. Mexican Muslims, black Muslims, Chinese Muslims, just, I don't even have to say Middle Eastern because we know that inherently they're Muslim by, by birth. So I'm interacting with all types of Muslims. And, and one of my first like real relationships, strong bonds, right, was with a guy that was Bin Laden's co-defendant for the 9-11 attacks, right? Yes, this, yeah. You got to read the book. 
I'm not going to tell you specifics because I wrote about it in the book, right? And uh, it, like, like, you know, one of the chapters that I got, I call it terrorist affiliated because in the federal level, where did you think they put the terrorists? They put the terrorists in federal prison. When I robbed a bank and it was a federally insured, they put me in federal prison with the terrorists. Hey, can't make that up. One of my first like real close knit friendships was with one of the guys that was responsible for the 9-11 attacks, right? He was from Kairoun, Sudan, and they convicted him for harboring Bin Laden in his home, right? I'm not gonna get into it because I talk about it in the book, but those interactions like that, the things that he taught me about Islam, the things that he taught me about our government, how the CIA operates in his country, you know, some of these things is like made an impression on me, but that impression was not the impression that the Muslim community thought I would have. That impression was like, well, listen, let me back up from all this. But I wrote Jailhouse Islam during the time that I was a member of that community, right? And as a member of the, the as a member of the community, I've seen a lot of things. I've seen people come in who were like sex offenders, right? And if you know anything about prison, you know, these are the people that like we get excited when a sex offender is coming to the prison. Because it's like, you know, people want to inflict harm, you know. Uh, when somebody who came to the prison, they might have been at another prison and they might have told on somebody and now they're getting transferred. It, you know, people waiting on them because these are the people that they look for in prison. What's, what was special about the inmate Muslim group is that the inmate Muslim group would like take these sex offenders and they will harbor them and they will protect them. As long as the sex offender carried himself like a Muslim, then he had that protection. So I wrote about that. I wrote about how gangbangers, like you would have Crips, right? And in high level prison, being a gang member is not enough security to be comfortable. So you would have gang members coming to the prison and then not only would they be gang members, but then they would switch their religion over and then they would identify as Muslim and then they would have that extra support. So in the federal prison, you would run into somebody and he would say, I'm a Crip Muslim. In life, I never heard of that. But in the penitentiary, you would have that. You would have a Crip Muslim. You would have a, uh, you just, all oh, just read the book. I start. I started documenting that. I wrote about that. It was amazing. Then I backed away from all that. I had a life to live. I don't got time to be getting caught up in politics about somebody who just joined a religion for comfort and safety. I don't have that. I don't got that much time. You know, I don't even. I don't have that energy to be playing with y'all like that. My situation is serious too serious to be worried about somebody else. That's so interesting, the dynamics of the way that religions kind of tie into affiliations and prison politics. And it's just so different in a women's prison. We definitely had Muslim ladies in our prison, but it was nothing, really nothing like what you were experiencing. Of course, I'm in a state prison, not in the Fed. So yeah, that's that's amazing. I can't wait for the book. You guys definitely check it out, Jailhouse Islam. Right now, you can buy it through uh, Amazon.com. Amazon has it for $13.99, and then the ebook is like $4. I'm going to put the link in the bio because I know you guys are going to want to read this book. I'm anxious to, for sure. So did yes. that community know that you were documenting some of those things? Okay, so this this is this is how it started, right? So when I get to the federal prison, uh, there's no federal prisons in Ohio, right? And I'm maximum security. So I was flown to Oklahoma, and then I was flown to a high security prison in Texas. So I was in Beaumont, Texas during, during my time. Communications was basically phone calls. Now you have 15 minute phone calls. And now I have a host of family members who want to know what's everything like. I got to do this with letters because for 15 minutes, 
you know, I don't want to talk about prison. You know, I want to see how y'all doing. I want to see what's going on, you know? You know, why is my daughter so bad? You see what's going on, right? So I didn't have time. So what I did, I started writing. Then if I'm writing one letter to somebody, I know I got to tell the other three people the same thing, right? So instead of writing, so when I write three letters, I'm basically was repeating the same, the same thing to this person. Then I write my sister, same thing. So what I started doing is just keep a journal. And then I told everybody, when I come home, y'all could just read my journals. And then my journals actually turned into the writings that are published right now. The only thing I did was just like change the, you know, the, some descriptions and things where the situation can't be traced back to just the, the specific individual. But everything, that's real life. The feeling that you get when you read my book, and you feel like how frightened I was in certain situations or how nervous I was or even how excited I was, these are the things that my readers can relate to in those situations. This is why I wrote it like that because I was in some serious situations. So I shared my thoughts that I was having at that moment. And the only reason I was able to do that at that moment to now was because of the journals. I was able to go back and look in my journals, find the situation, read how I felt about it. And decades later, I'm able to put my authentic feelings inside a book that you're going to read. That's incredible. Yeah. Did, did the laws ever read your journals? Because the prison that I was at, I, I was on a maximum security unit in Texas. Uh -huh. We had to be very careful about anything we wrote down because those laws were notorious for reading your mail, reading all of that. You'll have there you go. <laughs> Somebody called me for a private number and it just shut everything down. Yeah, it might do that. So <laughs> it did. then it'd be the telemarketers. Let me tell you about these telemarketers. They so good. They'd call like, hey Charles, right? And I'd be like, how you doing? I'm thinking they know me. Then they'd be like, this is time from a recorded line. I'd be like, what the? Every time. Charles, every time. when I first got home, and keep in mind, I only did like 10 and a half. When I first uh -huh. got home, I fell for three different scams. Um, uh -huh. One on Facebook. Yes, I was so out of there. I was so naive to the game out here uh -huh. now about how all of this operates. So uh, uh -huh. uh, you're probably, uh, you're probably more aware than I was, uh, but yeah, you have to stay alert because these people will tell you all kinds of things and you just assume, yes. I assumed if it's on Facebook, that it's legit, that people are renting houses that don't belong to them and all kinds of crazy stuff. So um, what I'm wondering is, did the officers ever read your journals? while you were there yes yes some of them I, you know i i've never received no 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 trouble behind it but fortunately like some of them turned to like some of my biggest supports in there like i was i worked in the edu education department in the max you know i you know i was a tutor you know i went through all the training so you know some of the staff i had to go to them like when i needed paper when i needed you know things and you know they would give it to me in 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 a, in a high level prison like that, you have to at least articulate why you want something. You see what I'm saying? So when I go in and I'm asking for this much paper, and I'm asking for these type of things, you know, eventually, you know, they like, man, what's going on? So you know, I, I have to show them, this is what I'm working on. This is what I'm doing, right? And some of them read it, and then some of them turned to other teachers, and then it's cause you know they're there. I'm, I'm writing a book about a place that I'm at, right? So when they read it, it was like, wow. They know the incident. They know I'm involved, but they didn't know how I felt, what I thought, why I, I, why I did the things that I did, right? And they was able to be like, you know what, man, go ahead. Whenever you need to get in the cabinet, get in the cabinet. Do this for yourself. Yes. So it's like them writings took a life of their own. I want to be in a situation where I can tell people like, hey, 
You can't get the jailhouse Islam without the Charles Harden. But I gave him so much Charles Harden in the book. We, but that's what you? make it also, yes, that's what make it what it is. It's authentic. It's it's when it's you, me. When you decided that community really wasn't for you, that that religion wasn't really the path for you, was there any backlash with stepping back out of that community while you were there? Okay, so the assault that they tried to carry out, let's just call it that, right? Of, of course they of course there was a black glass, of course, right. Of course, yeah. You don't join a group and then leave a group and just think that that it's it's more serious than that. But in my situation, you know, I had I had I'm from Ohio for one, and in Ohio we have like the whole Midwest. That's who that's who we get along with. You know, Ohio, Kansas, Iowa, Indiana, Michigan. You know, we're all one group in federal prison, right? So when you mess with me, you messing with seven states. I don't just come by myself. I come with a whole Midwest. But just it's the same though over there. If you mess with somebody from Atlanta, he doesn't just come from Atlanta. He come with all the inmates in the South. He coming with Texas. He's coming with Kentucky. He's coming, you see what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. when I stopped being a Muslim, I was embraced by the Midwest, you know? I was also embraced by the Crips, right? I'm not a Crip, not a game banger, but the influence that I had on my unit, right? So when the day that I was assaulted, I remember they was calling an emergency count. So I was standing in my cell and I noticed that my cell, he was kind of nervous. And then a lot of his belongings was missing out the cell. But again, this is emergency count. So I'm not paying attention. I'm just wondering like when I'm be able to get out the cell and get back to work. Right. You know, you've been through emergency counts. Right. But I, I wasn't able to, I didn't see all the warning signs. So he stayed in the cell with me and usually we are praying in the cell, but remember I'm not Muslim no more. But that day he didn't even pray. But I didn't, you know, hey, I don't care. It didn't strike me odd. It's just I'm ready to get back to work. And when the doors opened, he turned around and soccer punched me. Right. And then he said, uh, he said something about because because one of the Muslims was a sex offender, right? And he was in a leadership position. And I exposed him, right? So he had ended up paying somebody, he, he ended up trying to pay a thousand dollars to get me jumped on. But wouldn't nobody take it at first, right? But then he found somebody who would take it. And that person ended up to be my own bunkie. So my bunkie waited and then he soccer punched me when the doors opened up. You know, he jumped on me, you know, he like that. So as we struggled, one of the guys, he's from Washington State. Anyway, long story short, one of the guys that came up, he happened to be a crip. And when he came up and opened the door to ask me, was I going back to work with him? He seemed to scuffle. It took me, I remember this. I remember when they were stumping him in the cell, right? One of the guys that was stumping him, all he kept saying was, kill this mother. And I remember, I remember trying to grab him first. But then the other crip, it was like, you know how you push one person on and the other person step up? So I'm in the cell, I'm going through that. Like this, y'all is not killing him with me. Y'all is crazy. So anyway, I end up pushing the door open because we got the metal doors. So I pushed the door open and I, I pulled him out the cell. So when I was pulling him out the cell, the CO down on the unit start yelling up at this, you know, to stop that, yelling up there. So, you know, now when they do the man down, everybody coming, you know, they see the, the blood on me. They, you know, they handcuff me. They get him medical attention. They put us in the hole. Now, not only am I in the hole for that, but they put me in the hole with the same Crips that I prevented from killing him. Now I got to argue with them in the cell because they feel like that was a free body. Like he was in the cell. He hit me. They was coming in to help me. They feel like I messed up a, 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 something for them. And we would have been justified. Man, I ain't nobody going for that. You got, no. 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 Y'all kill him on y'all own time. You crazy. 
But that was the environment that I'm in. So I, I had to be sharp in that environment. Like I told you before, like I tell anybody, man, in that environment, I thrived. But I was, I never been so frightened. I never seen things that startled me so much, right? And then my interactions with people, it was like the things that you learn about people. For an example, there was a, 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 a terrorist that every time I got a chance, I antagonized him. I didn't hate, I hated him because he wore his terrorist attack like a badge of honor. It's not a badge of honor, brother. You know what I'm saying? But like I used to tell him, okay, so now you in prison, you would do something and you would kill a whole lot of people. But check this out. When people disrespect you and cut you in the line and treat you like you want to treat them, you won't fight nobody. But you will have behind some weapons and you will, you will shoot a gun into a crowd or you will leave a bomb in the crowd and then you'll try to be somewhere else like you didn't did something thorough. Now you in here with people like me. People like me, we walk up on who we want. I don't put no bomb in somebody's house and, and go a mile away and detonate it off. I, I, I catch them with walking to school. What's up with all that shit you was talking about? Let's get it. So I can't relate. But let me say this, because this is very important, and I want you to understand this, right? Is that a lot of young people like myself, when we go to these prisons, especially the max, we are already, we have already committed violence, right? So to say that we're prone to violence would be an understatement. We have already committed violence, and then we, you know, a lot of us still carry out violence as long as we can get away with it. So, so what I what I observed was like the leadership, especially the foreigners, because foreigners, when it comes to dealing with young black men, you know, they're witty. They know to they know how to appeal to our plight. You know, America would never have a black president. A black man would never do this. You know, foreigners, they know how to tell us this, and then they know how to give us what we think is another viable option. Islam love you. America don't love you, right? But then when I got over here and I looked at the Islam and I learned about the Islam, it's, see, you talking to a... See, listen, I did money for crime. That's why I went to prison. Every time I did money, every time I did a crime, it was for financial gain. But here I am now, and I'm talking to a bunch of people and I'm interacting with a bunch of people who are thinking that I'm anti-government. You see what I'm saying? or I'm um, anti-white people, or I'm not educated, right? So now when they talk to me and then I ask certain questions, now I'm disruptive. You see what I'm saying? How the fuck is I'm disruptive, bro? All I was asking you was that, and, and I asked whatever specific question I'm asking, right? For an example, what am I, if you read my book, you we had an issue about, about some females, right? So I was asking one of the one of the foreigners, bruh, what female do a woman get if she dies in the name of Islam, right? Because if 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 I die in the name of Islam, I get rewarded. I get like virgins and you know, I get a lot of things. And this is not about the religion. I have no problem with the religion. I'm only telling you how I interpret it and how I identify with it, right? So this is not about the religion. This is about Charles Harton. So, you know, I ask him, you know, what does a what does a, a woman get when she do it? Right? Because I know she don't want 75 virgins. Right? So at that time, he didn't know. But then he caught me in passing and he, he, he pulled me over and he said, listen, they get a garden. And I, I couldn't believe it. I said, no, I get 75 virgins and you telling me your women get a garden? And then he said, well, they get a garden and it has like rivers flow. He's trying to like make the garden big and beautiful. I said, no, it's, it's okay. So I went in and I researched it for myself, right? And it's amazing, like the disparity between the, like how a female is treated and how a male is treated. Nobody has that disparity in real life. Not, not in the family I was raised in. Well, well not you, now. You, yeah. Not now, yeah, but right. I mean, in 
when the Bible was written in biblical times, I mean, you could say the same for Christianity. Honestly, their their book, women are very right. much a second class citizen. Any any religion that makes a woman second class, I'm not going to be part of. Let's just say that. Charles, so you are in the hole with these guys, that these um, crips, and yes. they have stepped in to help you, and you you stopped them really. So how right. did it get? How did that go after? How was your relationship then with that affiliation? Okay, so with that affiliation, it's 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 great. It's great. I met a lot of I I I've, I met some good men. And unfortunately, a lot of them, they're never coming home. So that relationship is like leaving the fallen soldier behind. That's what that's like. Like, these are people that we ate together. We engaged in conflict together. We held each other accountable for, like, certain type of behaviors. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, just like the people that I affiliated with. If you tell a lie... Everybody would be surprised because we pride ourselves on being so direct, so straightforward. You know, like this is like past the assertive communication. You ever been to program and they teach assertive communication? Yes. See, in Rock in the Max, it's past assertive communication. It's like this is what I want you to do, and that's the communication. Now that you're home, are you still in contact with any of those guys? See, only my brother, only my brother, but through my brother, you know, I received those messages, those well wishes, those threats, because they say if I come back, they're going to do something to me. I can't go back to prison. Yes. They say if I come back with everything that I accomplished, oh my God, I can't go back. I can't, I can't fail. I can't. It's too many people that made sacrifices in order to see me succeed. That doesn't mean I'm not having my challenges. I'm, I'm, you know, I have my fair share of challenges out here, but I'm standing on the shoulders of some people that you would never know. And I hope that you would never have to know them. What's now for you, Charles? What's next? Okay, so this is where I'm at. I've been out in the community. Next week, I'm what they call employment eligible. So I'm looking, I'm looking forward to having a job uh, coming up soon, right? So my thing is that I want to save for like all the important stuff, the uh, car insurance, you know, the money to take the permit test, the money to take the driver's test, the money to buy insurance, right? Because the way that I'm being counseled, right, is that Okay, I could save up for an apartment. First month rent, last month rent, right? And then I leave here and then I have that paid up. But then I have guys in the background who will counsel me and say, okay, bro, don't forget about this. Don't forget about, you got to get your lights turned on. That comes with a deposit. Not only does that come with a deposit, you got water, you got gas, you got... So right now, I'm in one of them, and, and I'm in a situation where I'm just being bombarded with information that you may not read in the book or somebody may say you hey make sure you save your money your rent money because that's what they tell you at the halfway house go to work save you some money find your apartment and when you have your first month last month rent you can leave but then you have guys in the background like no no you got utilities you got gas you got food like this the the council that i get is it's much larger or more in depth than I assumed. Yes. And I Charles, went through college. Yeah. 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 It's college doesn't teach you these things. And I, so you're 49 years old. Have you ever paid rent before? What's, what's rent? Yeah. For like what's an apartment. Rent? Have you ever oh. had your own place? Nah. You know what rent is to me? It's like... Right. I give you a couple soups, and then you give me three back. You rented out them two for three. That's rent. I I got it. I got this. It, it's it's it's. I'm not gonna say that I have the best dynamics where I'm from, 
you know, my family is, is like every other family. You know, we, we, we have our dysfunction and each individual have their own individual challenges in my family, right? I'm using this time that when I do step out, or like all the way out, that I won't be any unnecessarily burden on the people who want to help me the most. You see what I'm saying? I have, my sister home is open to me. The resources that she have are open to me. I have to be responsible with that type of, of, of support. You know, I have to use that to the, my best. And rushing out there and fumbling that is not the best way to take advantage of the support that I have right now. It's not the best way. I feel like we could talk for a whole nother hour. I hope that maybe you'll meet with me again um, in the next few weeks. If you have another free hour, I would love to, okay. I would love to continue our conversation for right. today. You have given us so many gems and so much insight and I appreciate it. And I am so excited to read your book and all of that good stuff. So right. today, do you have anything else that you want to add today that maybe I didn't ask you about, or maybe you didn't get to say yet? Maybe you had something in mind when you knew we were going to talk? Well, this, right? Just for everybody that's going to come across my page, or if you have already seen my videos, do you notice I put like be the change in a lot of my videos? Or I may put like join the conversations, right? Those, them two slogans, right? I'm not, I don't just put that in there just to say that. But my thing is this, is that when you, when you subscribe to my YouTube or when you join my Facebook, this is what I'm on. These are the conversations that I actually want to have with people, right? I don't mind talking about my past and the experiences that I have and then the circumstances. But you also have to give me the opportunity to tell you about the things that I learned and how I never put myself in those situations again. See, they go hand in hand. So when you do follow me, or for the people who follow me, and you do want to interact with me, you're not going to just get all the bad. I'm sorry. You're not going to hear all the war stories without hearing all the lessons. They go hand in hand, you know? So I want to be the change, right? In order to be the change, I have to use every opportunity that's available to make that impression. And that's that's what I'm about. Like I said, when you read my you when you read my things, see, I, I like to inspire people, you know, I like to motivate people to look at things objectively. Because when we look at things objectively, then we're able to understand it better and we're able to make better choices. You know, so a lot of times when I have conversations or when I meet people. You know, a lot of times, you know, people like to vent. People like to look at things real negative. I understand it. I'm in the same environment as you. But then when they're done talking, now it's time to look at, like, what we can do to figure out how we're going to make this situation better. And if we can't make the prison better, then it's only one option. You have to make yourself better. That's where I'm at with it. Be the change. You have to make yourself better. You are in the halfway house right now. Are you in a position yeah. where you could walk around and show us a little bit for anybody that maybe okay. wants to see what we're dealing with? Okay, so then let's because right now I'm currently in the in the weight room, right? This is a place that I'm familiar with because I try to keep myself healthy as possible. Drink a lot of water, I work out, you know, just I don't want to come home broke down. Listen, when I come home, I want everybody to just you know, I wanted to be overall healthy, but this is what I do is, do they have a thing on here where this camera turns around? Yeah. Um, okay, there you so, go. Okay. Bye. There All you right. Go. So again, this is my favorite spot of the prison. The, 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 the area where I, I, I keep myself healthy. They call it a weight room, but where I, so when I leave the weight room, we have, okay. Let's do this. Okay, so we have the common area, right? So this is the day room area. You see how everybody gets the lounge around? Then we have uh, what we have. Uh, 
Nobody's watching TV. We have uh, what they call the kids. They love to play this. I have never Xbox played this, but I, what's this called? They have video games, right? I don't play video games, but I get it. Case manager. That's a case manager. Uh, she's over like the cognitive thinking programs. Mm, just. Oh, y'all got a pool tournament going on? Oh, we, we done ran into a pool tournament. How many games y'all played already? None. Are y'all just going to get started? Okay. Well, these guys are just going to get started, so they haven't played no games. So uh, let's see. Let's go this way. It's my guy right here. What's up, Willie? <laughs> yeah. It's my other guy right here. <laughs> okay, so now this is the yard, right? You see this little bit? Yeah. You see, I'm going back this way because that's it. That's our yard. That's how, let me step out here because I do not want you to mistake what I'm saying. This is the whole yard from here to there. You see how that guy walking? Uh huh. Yeah. So it's not a lot of space here, right? So a lot of the times when we get into them negative situations and it's spread throughout the facility, there's nowhere to go. So a lot of time that negativity, it just bottles itself up and then it just explodes how it explodes. And a lot of times you have to be ready for that. You know, you have to be like sharp mentally or even emotionally, you know, you have to be sharp because like when the tension builds up and when it explodes, if you're not able to process that and handle that, in the proper manner, you will find yourself engaging in all type of conflict. You know? So. And then this is my second, this is my second best place, right? <laughs> this right uh -huh. here. Yeah, what I usually do is, I usually, I post up. Uh-oh, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah, I can hear you. This is where I make my, some of my videos. Like I will post up and then I will sit here and I will make my videos. If I'm not in the weight room, I will make it from here from the laundry room. So this okay. is, this is- That's your studio. Even though you don't see this in the video, this is where I make some of my videos at, right? Oh, I'll make it- Uh-oh, Charles, you muted it. You accidentally hit, the, there you go. Okay, somebody, somebody just tried to call me. Okay, then we got the second TV. All right. Okay. So listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go down this hallway. I I, I hope that we're able to stay. Okay. So. Okay. This is this is not my dorm, but this is just one of the dorms. But all the dorms are kind of like built like this. What's going on, man? How you doing today, man? You got a job already? Oh, okay. I've been, I've been here all these months. I ain't got a job yet. Well, I'm just saying, it's like I've been working in the kitchen and huh? my reward for working in the kitchen. Oh, they get your reward? Well, it's like extra shit. What's this right here? Oatmeal cream pie. Oh, you got an oatmeal cream pie for working in the kitchen? I got four of them. Wow. I got three of the breakfast bars all right. and nine snickerdoodle cookies. Yeah, hey, that's a good day's work. What's up with it, player? Also, uh, but I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to stall, but where's the turnaround thing? There it go. It's, okay. Okay. It's like Denzel Washington so much. Yeah. This man right here. <laughs> this is Hi. the man who cuts my hair. Hi. 